The Battle of Verdun was fought in 1916 between Germany and France during the First World War. In 1914, the German invasion of France was halted at the Battle of the Marne. Thus, the War of Movement had ended, the front lines stabilized, and a new phase of bloody trench warfare had begun. The War of Movement in 1914 was extremely deadly, causing hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. And the trench warfare of 1915 was no exception. Artillery, barbed wire, machine guns all made it incredibly difficult for infantry to cross open ground. Commanders on both sides initially failed to develop any new tactics. And so capturing an entrenched position was simply impossible to accomplish without taking massive casualties. In 1915, both sides would try unsuccessfully to break the stalemate. The British and French began planning an offensive at the Somme. And further south, the Germans were planning their offensive at Verdun. The German high command chose Verdun because of its strategic importance and its symbolism. Sitting on the Meuse River, Verdun played an important role in the defense of France for centuries. Attila the Hun had failed to seize the town in the 5th century. In a way, the modern nation-states of Germany and France had their roots in Verdun. When after the death of Charlemagne, at the Treaty of Verdun in 843, the Frankish Empire was divided in three, creating West Francia, which would later become the Kingdom of France, and East Francia, which would later become the Kingdom of Germany. The village of Verdun would become part of the Holy Roman Empire, which also included the Kingdom of Germany. After the Thirty Years' War, in 1648, Verdun was awarded back to France in the Peace of Westphalia. Lastly, Verdun was one of the last French cities to fall during Germany's successful invasion of France during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. The city had sentimental value for both sides. If the Germans could succeed in achieving a breakthrough here and capture Verdun, they could then continue on to threaten Paris. If this could be done, it was hoped that the French would then seek armistice terms. The German commander, Erich von Falkenhayn, planned to capture the Meuse Heights, an excellent defensive position with good observation for artillery fire on Verdun. Even if Verdun itself could not be captured, the Germans hoped that the French would commit their strategic reserve to recapture the Meuse Heights and suffer catastrophic losses at relatively little cost for the Germans. Falkenhayn would later claim in a supposed memorandum to the Kaiser that the goal of the battle was actually not to capture Verdun and eventually Paris, but instead to draw the French into a costly battle that favored the Germans, and then, by attrition, the forces of France would bleed to death. On the 21st of February, the battle began with a nine-hour German artillery barrage of over 1,000 guns on a 20-kilometer front. General Falkenhayn, when speaking of the barrage, ordered, no line is to remain unbombarded. No possibilities of supply unmolested. Nowhere should the enemy feel safe. The Germans fired over 1 million shells during this initial barrage, with 40 shells per minute landing at the French village of Bois de Ville. The explosions could even be heard over 100 miles away.
By 8 a.m., almost all of the French communications to the front line had been cut off. Much of the French defenses had been neutralized or destroyed. The French were in a state of total confusion and disarray. An effective command structure no longer existed, and French reinforcements were delayed. When the barrage was finally lifted at 4 p.m., the German infantry advanced. This initial advance was limited, however, as Falkenhayn instructed his troops to instead continue scouting out the enemy positions, focusing on identifying enemy positions not yet destroyed by the artillery. The Germans did just that, and by nightfall, another artillery barrage was launched, decimating the French positions even further. The German infantry attacked swiftly using flamethrowers and automatic weapons, followed closely by stormtroopers with rifles slung using hand grenades to kill the remaining defenders. By February 22nd, the Germans had advanced 5 kilometers and captured 3,000 French prisoners. 
On the 24th, the Germans broke through between Beaumont and saint mandou and the French positions fell in a matter of hours. The Germans took 10,000 more prisoners and continued pushing deep into French territory. By February 25th, the French 51st and 72nd Divisions, holding the line from Hervevois to the Meuse, had suffered 60% casualties. The French were falling back and morale was plummeting. The French fort at Douaumont, which dominated the northern approach to the city of Verdun, fell to the Germans without hardly a single shot being fired. The garrison which manned the fort had previously been reassigned to the front line. The loss of Fort Douaumont was a massive psychological setback for France and a victory for Germany. The German advance finally stopped that day, just two miles short of Verdun itself. A French counterattack at Dormont failed, and the French commander, Philippe Pétain, ordered that no more attempts were to be made. The front-line defenses were consolidated. Other forts were then garrisoned, rearmed, resupplied, and instructed to withstand a siege if surrounded. Pétain knew that the loss of Verdun would be an unacceptable blow to French national morale and ordered his men to, quote, beat off at all costs the attacks of the enemy and retake immediately any land taken by him. The German advance began to slow when French reinforcements arrived on the 27th, strengthening the effectiveness of the defense. A thaw turned the ground into a swamp, and some German artillery became stranded in the mud. This as well as heavy snowfall on the 29th and the stiff resistance of the French 33rd Infantry Regiment was able to contain the German advance with heavy fighting around the village of Douaumont. Bataan had two main objectives from this point on, that is, to coordinate the deployment of the artillery and open a supply line. Central to the success of the French defense was the artillery. Now with the French artillery in position, the Germans, like the French, whether attacking or staying at the front line, from this point on, were subjected to near constant artillery fire. In March, the German attacks continued, but had no advantage of surprise and faced a determined and well-supplied adversary in fortified defensive positions. The German artillery could still decimate the French defenses and enabled German infantry to make small advances, but the French artillery could do the same for the French infantry when they counterattacked. Every piece of land was fiercely contested by the French. Despite this, the Germans were steadily gaining ground. By the end of March, the Germans had taken 80,000 casualties, and Falkenhayn began to think of ending the offensive. However, the 5th Army Staff requested more reinforcements on the 31st of March, with an optimistic report claiming that the French were close to exhaustion. Falkenhayn also received reports of staggering French losses, estimating five French soldiers killed for every one German. In reality, the French losses were not that high, with the kill-to-death ratio not being 5 to 1, but 1.1 to 1. Nevertheless, Falkenhayn resumed the attack, determined to seize the Meuse Heights. Early April saw yet more costly German attacks, and in early May, General Pétain was promoted and General Robert Nivelle took over command. On May 22nd, the French launched a bold assault to retake Fort Douaumont. Despite taking heavy casualties, the French 129th Infantry Regiment reached the fort and managed to breach the defenses on the west and south sides. By nightfall, about half of the fort had been recaptured. However, French attempts to reinforce the fort failed, and the Germans managed to cut off the French troops inside, forcing them to surrender taking 1,000 prisoners. Soon after, the Germans launched an assault on Fort Vaux, reaching the top of the fort by June 2nd. Fighting went on underground until the garrison ran out of water, and the 574 survivors surrendered on June 7th. 
When news of the loss of Fort Vaux reached Verdun, panic spread, and trenches were dug on the edge of the city. Heavy rains slowed the German advance towards Fort Souville, where both sides attacked and counterattacked for the next two months. Fleury was captured and the Germans came within four kilometers, just two miles of the Verdun Citadel. But on July 1st, the British launched an offensive at the Somme, hoping to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun. The Germans therefore were forced to cut back the offensive at Verdun to provide troops, artillery, and ammunition for the defense of the Somme leading to a similar transfer of the French 10th Army to the Somme as well. From the 23rd of June to the 17th of August, Fleury changed hands 16 times and a German attack on Fort Souville failed. On the 29th of August, Falkenhayn was replaced as Chief of General Staff by Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff. Now with the Germans diverting troops to the Somme, the French seized the initiative. By September, French counterattacks had retaken much of the ground lost in July and August. In October of 1916, the French launched yet another massive counterattack to recapture Fort Douaumont. In a six-day bombardment, the French artillery fired 855,000 shells. The 38th, 133rd, and 74th infantry divisions attacked at 11.40 a.m. The French infantry advanced behind a creeping field artillery barrage, moving at a rate of 50 meters, 55 yards, and two minutes. The Germans had partly evacuated Douaumont, which was captured on the 24th by French Marines and Colonial Infantry. More than 6,000 prisoners and 15 guns were captured by the French. Fort Vaux was also eventually recaptured soon after, and on the 5th of November, the French reached the original front line of the 24th of February, and offensive operations ceased until December. Finally, on December 15th, the French 126th Division, 38th Division, 37th Division, and the 133rd Division launched a final attack at Verdun with 740 heavy guns in support. The attack began at 10 a.m. on the 15th of December after a six-day bombardment of one million shells fired from 827 guns. Five German divisions supported by 533 guns held the defensive line, which was 2,300 meters deep with two-thirds of the infantry in the battle zone and the remaining one-third in reserve.
Отряд ликвидирован! Despite attacking in very bad weather, the French reached their objectives, which had been lost in February, along with some additional territory. Two of the German divisions were under strength, with only 3,000 infantry instead of their normal 7,000. The German defense collapsed, and 13,000 men of the 21,000 and the five front divisions were lost, some having been trapped while under cover and others taken prisoner when the French infantry arrived. By the 18th of December, 1916, the nightmare at Verdun was finally over, and the battle had achieved nothing. The front line was now basically back to the original starting place in February. With Verdun still in French hands, the battle ended with a French victory, but it was a costly one and a rare example of a successful defense where the defenders lost even more men than the attackers. The Battle of Verdun lasted for 302 days the longest and one of the most costly battles in human history. The French suffered 380,000 casualties and the Germans 330,000. A staggering total of over 700,000. An average of 70,000 casualties per month. It is sobering that the number of German and French killed at Verdun was, according to one estimate, around 400,000, greater than the total dead from the British Empire in World War II. Falkenhayn had claimed he had wanted to bleed the French white by attrition, and this almost worked, but unfortunately, he had almost bled his own army to death in the process. Years after the battle, General Patton remembered the men he had commanded at Verdun. Quote, Their expressions, he wrote, seemed frozen by a vision of terror. Their great, their postures betrayed a total dejection. They sagged beneath the weight of horrifying memories. They had passed through a fiery ordeal, and neither they nor the Europe they had once known were ever the same after it. To say that the French fought bravely is an understatement. The French fought valiantly. They fought like lions. And the Germans too. A German soldier who fought in the battle on the topic of the French dead remarked, all these corpses had been men who breathed as I breathed, had had a father, a mother, a woman whom they loved, a piece of land which was theirs, faces which had expressed joy and suffering, which had known the light of day and the color of the sky,